Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. John McWhorter teaches linguistics, American studies, and music history at Columbia University. He is a contributing editor at The Atlantic and the host of Slate's Lexicon Valley podcast. McWhorter is the author of 20 books, including The Power of Babel, A Natural History of Language, Losing the Race, Self-Sabotage in Black America, and Our Magnificent Bastard Tongue, The Untold History of English. John McWhorter. Thanks, folks. Um, it's very rare that anybody asks me to read. Um, it's very rare that anybody asks me about my writing process. Thank you, Robert, because I think most people are under the understandable impression that if you're an opinion writer, there's no craft to your writing. You're just expressing the opinions. And that's just that's just inevitable. But I'm 
flattered that somebody would want me to actually read from one of my books. So I'm going to try to do that. And I chose this one, which is called The Language Hoax. And that was a sensational title that was kind of forced on me by the publisher. But what it was about is an idea about language that a lot of you may have heard and that frankly needs to be tempered and probably can only really be tempered in a real way by somebody who spends their life trying to study every language in the world. And that's what I am as a linguist, not literally every language, but often this is written about by psychologists and written about by journalists, and those are great writings. But this was a linguist perspective on the question, and I hope it doesn't end up sounding sour, but in terms of me and being a writer, and the writing process, I remember thinking this introduction, I'm just going to read the introduction to the book, is a matter of trying to write it properly. I wasn't just expressing an opinion. So um, this is the introduction to The Language Hoax. This book is about 10 years old now, but I, 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 I liked it. So introduction. This book is a manifesto. I will oppose an idea about language that took hold among certain academics starting in the 1930s, and of late has acquired an unseemly amount of influence over public discussion as well. This is the idea that people's languages channel the way they think and perceive the world. You may be familiar with it. Among memories of your readings over the past several years may dwell Amazonian tribes people described as unable to do math because their language doesn't have numbers. Or you may have read about people who have the same word for green and blue, who we imagine not being able to perceive the difference in color between a leaf and the sky as vividly as we do. The whole idea is a kind of ongoing promo from the worlds of linguistics, anthropology, and psychology. The ad jargon typified by the subtitle of Guy Deutscher's book, Through the Looking Glass, Why the World Looks Different in Other Languages. The notion is, for better or for worse, mesmerizing. Just think, what we speak is what we are. We are the language that we speak. This is true, of course, to an extent. A take-home insight from the idea that language channels thought is that a language's words and grammar are not just a random constellation, but are the software for a particular culture. No one could deny that there's some truth in that. In Thai, there are different words for you according to seven different grades of formality, and to not use them is to not be Thai, unless you're a child or new to the language. To pretend this has nothing to do with the highly stratified nature of Thai society in the past and present would be peculiar. Vocabulary also reflects cultural concerns and not only in obvious areas such as technology and slang. Few people could be truly intrigued that we have names for computer components and salty terms relating to things like dating and social mores. However, quieter things say more than we always notice. Once while staying at a hotel in the Bahamas, I noticed a rather lovely cat gliding around outside. A Caribbean I was with said, oh, that must be the hotel cat. That is a cat who lives more or less around the place and serves as an unofficial mascot. I'd never heard of a hotel cat. It would never occur to me to put hotel and cat together. And in fact, to me, part of the essence of the hotel experience would seem to be an absence of cats. However, that my friend would mention a hotel cat suggested that the relationship between felines and hotels was different depending on where I was. Even a detail in the way he said it gave away that he was referring to something culturally entrenched. He didn't accent it as hotel cat, but as hotel cat. If you think about it, the second way of saying it means that hotel cats are, as one says these days, a thing. Think of how we say ice cream rather than iced cream as one did when it was a novelty, or cell phone rather than cell phone as I recall people saying in the early 1990s. In two-word expressions, the accent tends to shift like that when something becomes a thing. That is culture. From the Caribbean man's one utterance and not even a foreign one, I learned that mascot cats at hotels were a component of the local culture. But the language as thought idea refers to much more than what qualifies it to its speakers as a thing. We're to suppose that the way a language's grammar works and the way it applies words to even mundane objects and concepts shapes how its speakers experience life in far ways beyond deserts and gadgets. Hotel cats, sure, 
But what about a language that gives you a whole different sense of time than anything we can spontaneously imagine, even if we're from the Bahamas? This all became a going concern with Benjamin Lee Worf's proposition in the 1930s that the Native American language Hopi has no way to mark time, no tense markers, no words like later, and that this corresponded with the Hopi sense of how time and the world work. English obsesses with placing events in the present, past, or future, Worf argued, in contrast to a language like Hopi with no present, past, and future. In Worf's sense of Hopi, present, past, and future are in essence the same, corresponding to the cyclical sense of time in Hopi cosmology. Thus, it's not by chance that Hopi has no equivalent to English's between walk, walked, and will walk. It's about thought patterns, culture. In Hopi, whether it's about yesterday, tomorrow, or right now, you just walk. Worf was a fire inspector by day, and perhaps coming to linguistic study from the outside made him more likely to come up with out-of-the-box insights than would a card-carrying linguist. Because of Worf's pioneering role in the field of linguistics, the whole idea has been coined Worfianism, or the Sapir-Worf hypothesis. Edward Sapir was a mentor of Worf's who found the idea similarly compelling. Or among academics, linguistic relativity and linguistic determinism. Under any name, the idea that grammar channels people into thinking of time as cyclical is catnip. Even a well-fed hotel cat would eat it up. Or a college student, such as the one I once was. I got a dose of this version of Hopi linguistic anthropology in 1984, and it's now the sole thing I remember from the class, except that we read some of The Last of the Mohicans and that the teacher was a Tom Petty lookalike who seemed ineffably sad. Worf, however, wasn't, and he had an agenda laudable in itself. He wanted to show that people dismissed even by the educated as quote-unquote savages in his time were as mentally developed as Westerners are. His was an era when, for example, none other than the Webster's Second New International Dictionary, cherished as a staple of the proper middle-class home, defined Apaches as of warlike disposition and relatively low culture. Yet, as with so many tantalizing and even well-intentioned notions, this conception of the Hopi language turned out to be wrong. Hopi marks time as much as anyone else would expect a language to, with good old-fashioned tense markers and plenty of words for things like already and afterward. Furthermore, attempts over the next few decades to reveal Native Americans as cognitively distinct from Westerners because of mental filters exerted by their languages never bore fruit. For example, if in Navajo there are different words for move, depending on whether it is one, two, or several people doing the moving. Does that mean that Navajos have a thing about moving as central to existence? Linguist Harry Hoyer thought so in the 1960s. His overall career was invaluable in documenting fascinatingly complex languages on the brink of extinction. But he, a disciple of Edward Sapir, as Worf had been, was open to Worfianism to an extent not uncommon, among Native American language specialists of his time. When it came to Navajo, he linked its proliferation of move verbs to Navajo's nomadism in the past, and even to figures in their mythology moving to repair the dynamic flux of the universe. But wait, what about all the other languages in the world that also happen to get particular about going and moving? In Russian, how you say go is so complicated that whole books are written about it, and it's one of the last things non-Native learners manage to get right. The word is different depending on whether you walked or rode, and then after you have that figured out, it's depending on whether you came back after you went, and in addition, all the forms of it are irregular. Yet, nomadism is not exactly central to the Russian soul, and the last time I checked, Russian's interest in repairing the dynamic flux of the universe seemed rather low. Yet, beyond obscure academic journals, it's easy to miss how poorly the Warfian idea has fared scientifically. Of late, especially popular books, well-publicized studies, and other works have established a Worfian meme in public discussion. It's easy to suppose that one of the most interesting things about language is that people whose languages assign genders to inanimate objects perceive those objects as meaningfully more male or female than speakers of English. How things mark neuter fit into this, I've never quite understood, or that Russians are more meaningfully sensitive to the difference between dark blue, light blue, and green, than Koreans who have a single word that covers blue and green. Robert, how much longer should I go? You can wrap it up now or you might just over a couple of minutes.
let me wrap it up in one minute. I'll do a little more. So, however, the whole notion that how someone's language works determines in any significant way how they see the world is utterly incoherent and even dangerous. Therefore, I have two goals in this book. One will be to complement the opposing case from psychology, such as Steven Pinker's, from one from linguistics, showing why this idea of languages as pairs of glasses doesn't hold water in the way that we may understandably wish it did. This becomes clear from a perspective encompassing the world's languages, rather than just a few at a time, upon which we see how Warfianism forces us into endless contradictions, unwitting disparagement of billions of the world's human beings, and even cartoonish perspectives about ourselves. We will see that a broader perspective on languages makes one glad that the neo-Warfian studies don't support the language as a lens theory any more than they do. Glad to an extent that if they were more supportive, you'd likely consider the public better kept in the dark about it. So, in that vein, my message is not a negative one in the end. The other goal of the book will be to show that we can vibrantly acknowledge the intelligence and sophistication of indigenous people in another way, by stressing that all humans are mentally alike. Languages viewed in a worldwide sense show this much more clearly than they reveal 6,000 distinct worldviews and point us to the larger and ultimately more useful truth. Language is a lens indeed, but upon humanity, much more than upon humanities, and here's why. Then the rest of the book was about that. So that is the beginning of the language hooks. So there is some of my writing, and I do I do that kind of writing all the time. Excellent, thank you. So now it's the part where I'm going to walk here and sit. Thank you. Also being moving the camera. Yeah, we see the ladies. <laughs> great. Um, so I've had a great time the last few weeks preparing for this, reading through a lot of your work. Um, no, no, it really, really was great. Um, so about 20 years ago, I had five years of Latin. <laughs> Some of that is still with me. It's been haunting me ever since. Um, and a lot of things that I kind of knew implicitly from learning Latin and then being very confused looking at English have made so much more sense to me. Uh, with your work, I noticed, you know, how much more complete Latin grammar is in comparison to English. Also that there's all these bits of um, annoying bits of English grammar that really only make sense if you know Latin. But I was like this weird 10th grader telling people like, of course you can't split infinitives because in Latin, it's just one word. How could you get an adjective in the middle there? Um, and then I also then was like very- People turn on the mic, actually, and they'll turn green. Oh. This one is red, is that? Yeah. I think it becomes green. Oh, now it's green. Okay, so now the mic is actually working. <laughs> so I was talking about, um, yeah learning Latin, feeling kind of crazy that there's all of this structure to Latin that was lost in English. So my first question for you is, um, the fuck happened to English? And then D-A-F-U-K. And then the second question is, why is that intelligible as a question? Because you also have a book about profanity. So let's start with the first question and then we'll circle around to why that is a grammatically sensible question <laughs> so is the question what happened to english yeah yeah english is a really weird language because it's not the way it would be if it were passed on the way normal languages usually have been until relatively recently when languages are passed on from one generation to another and it's rare that adults ever learn the language. They get really complicated, more complicated than an English speaker thinks languages usually are. So you learned Latin with all those bells and whistles. And from our perspective, I remember suffering through that. You're thinking, God, there's so much of it. What is all this stuff? Where the real question is, why doesn't English have that stuff? Old English was just like Latin in that way. But Old English got hit with a kind of a dive bomb of Vikings learning it as adults and then marrying native English speaking women, they would have spoken English, these Vikings, roughly the way a lot of us might speak Spanish. I'm just guessing based on my own Spanish, but that's the way it was. There was no school, there was no media. That's the way they always talked and kids grew up hearing English spoken that way. And next thing you knew, English was this. 
which is nothing like what it kind of should be. And most of the languages of the world are much more needlessly elaborate. That's the thing. All of that stuff in Latin, most of it is an accident. It's not about expressing a worldview. It's not about that their lives were more complicated than our lives. It's that English is an unusually streamlined language. So we're that that perspective. And then the issue of um, the fuck is that it's not a word anymore. It's really just a little eruption that comes from your midbrain, practically, that is no longer connected with intercourse or any literal meaning. Profanity like that is a kind of a, a spice, which is why what the fuck happened to English doesn't make any kind of grammatical Catholic school tree parsing sense. What is the fuck? And how does it fit in? It's it's nothing. It's really just kind of going like, so that is the answer to that question. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, and I'm reading your work. I was really surprised by, like, if you actually slow down and try to take profanity literally, so much of it makes absolutely no sense that it can be a verb, it can be a subject, it can be an interrogative, it can be like all, like anything we want language to be, like profanity does it in one sense or another. Especially in English, that word. And then in other languages, it's some other one word. And in Russian, it's, if I may, dick that does all of those sorts of things. But yeah, it's not language, really. It's something else. Yeah. And since we're getting into profanity, um, you also write in, the, in that same book about how people will oftentimes like reach for more abstract or more foreign words in order to distance themselves from something that seems impolite or profane, right? So some of the examples you give are saying like, using the word behind instead of but or ass or saying derriere, even like reaching into another language to borrow the, their vocabulary to almost soften or distance ourselves from these things that we might be afraid of saying. And I think relevant to all of the writers in this room is like, we really want our work and our words to be immediate and visceral and powerful. And all of these habits of distancing ourselves from the things that we're saying in order to be polite or to do academic writing, right? A lot of us were trained our whole lives before coming to an MFA program like this to, you know, not use obscenities, not write about the body, not write about anything taboo. And now we're almost unlearning all of that to try to be more profane and not necessarily just cursing all the time, but to like write with this immediate immediacy that like our norms teach us not to have. So I'm curious um, if that's that been true of your experience and of your writing, that you kind of have to be comfortable. And I'm sure it was uncomfortable writing a book all about profanity, um, using those words on, you know, 20 times on every single page. Actually, no. And, and <laughs> what actually, what that actually touches on is I'm just looking at that stack. Power of Babel was one of my earlier ones and will always be my favorite. <clears throat> the what my two girls call the fuck book and then <laughs> woke woke racism are very recent they were written practically back to back and i'm just thinking as i'm getting a little older what in the world do those three things plus the language hoax have in common and it is that i have always bristled against the idea that nonfiction writing is supposed to be in a tie that you're supposed to use a lot of big words and certainly never curse don't tell any stories about yourself and I have readers who complain about that, like not that I have ever looked at my Amazon reviews, but there are people who, <laughs> you know, say his style is too casual by half. And I take that as a compliment from the very beginning. I thought I'm not going to write in that bow tied way. I'm going to write more or less the way I talk. And all of my books sound like that. I wouldn't let an editor change it. And there are people who don't get it. But as far as I'm concerned, it's what I consider why it's fun to write how you talk to people in your writing and how it'll stand up over time. So Power of Babel is me, the hobbyist, just spilling. Nine Nasty Words is not only full of profanity, but it's just me sitting with a drink spilling about profanity. Woke Racism was written fueled by bourbon in about 10 minutes. And I was thinking, you know, this is one where I'm just going to write exactly what I just said in a podcast. And that's exactly how it came out. This one was a little bit more sober, but only because my now 12 year old daughter had just been born and I hadn't had any sleep. And so that one's a little, little more buttoned up because I wasn't having so much fun, but very important to write from the heart. But euphemism is universal in languages. There's always a way of 
writing with a distance or writing with a certain respect, there are always certain taboos that we observe. And so one of the big points in Nine Nasty Words, I would not have written it if it just went from damn to words like shit. I didn't find that very interesting, but I realized slurs are our profanity. And to the extent that we would now, you know, we have this recording where we're talking about D-A-F-U-K, but there are other words that we would not dream of using, which one would have within reason 30 years ago, like, for example, the N-word. I don't think anybody was saying that 30 years ago. You just either didn't say it or you did say it if you were just referring to it. We don't do that anymore. So that is our taboo. It's hard not to have any. It just depends on what society is most concerned with at the time. Yeah, and you talk about this transition where the biggest taboo at first is like any violation against God. So words like hell oh, and my damn God. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. are the biggest thing. And also like people making an oath would be this huge social contract because you don't have, you know, most people are illiterate. They're not signing contracts. So saying, I swear to God would be a huge deal and violating that would be unimaginable. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, talk a little bit through that transition about what the biggest taboos have been at various times. Profanity starts with God and Jesus, because you're not supposed to swear to them unless you mean it. And so when we say he was swearing, it's short for swearing in vain. That's where that expression comes from. And this was considered a terrible thing to do, because if you can't write it down, how do you attest to something? You swear openly with people watching. Then as conceptions of privacy started changing, the major pox was on issues of the body. And so in early medieval English, people refer to you know, things that go out of your body and things you might want to do with your body very freely. Like it's kind of, they snicker maybe, but you could, a, a person could be named and it isn't a joke. It isn't Monty Python. People who were taken seriously were named things like Roger fuck butter, Henry fuck by the navel. That sort of thing was just considered ordinary. Henry fuck by the navel was actually in the King's retinue. And there was no Monty Python, but that changes and it gets to the point rather recently that those things are okay. That's roughly in my, I'm 58, that's happened in my life that we don't take those words as seriously anymore. Then came the slurs. So it starts with religion, then it becomes the body, then it becomes defaming groups of people. It'd be interesting to know what it's going to be next, but it, you definitely have those three phases. You go from, oh my God, to shit to the n-word or see you next tuesday as our president has apparently recently said to a woman so that sort of thing but then when words become taboo it almost does give them some power right that kids because they know they're not supposed to say it those are the words that they like ask their brothers old you know older brothers friends and that like whatever we're not supposed to say almost becomes paradoxically more at the front of our minds yeah and then often it gets reclaimed as a term of affection. That also happens too. That's happened with the N-word, with similar words that you can imagine. That happens in other languages as well. But yeah, when you prescribe a word, that's never the end of the story. It really gives it a kind of power. And maybe that's just the way that it has to be. But you cannot snuff a word out completely, or at least I can't think of an example. Cool. And then a slight pivot. So a bunch of us are in Robert's class um, we're writing flash fiction and generally stories of 1,000 words or less. Um, oh, I'm old and unliterary. What is flash fiction? <laughs> yeah, so it's stories with basically 1,000 words or less. Sometimes they cut it at 750. And then the other characteristic is that it, it has a turn like a volta in a sonnet where, you know, you don't have time for plot to unfold, but you can have one little turn uh, where maybe you zoom out or the focus or the emphasis changes and the story clicks into meaning something a little different. Um, so I'm curious, so flash fiction, because it's so short, we end up trying to basically cut away all of these syntactical words, cut away subordinating conjunctions. We just want to have interesting nouns, interesting verbs for it to stand out as much as possible. Um, and oftentimes we're searching for words that like, it's not a swear word, but it almost could be, right? That it's a one syllable, it has these hard consonants. Um, and I'm curious, yeah, like linguistics is where it's filled with all these rules that the average person doesn't know that they know, right? So like, even if you don't know a, you know, subordinating conjunction, you still look at it in a flash piece at a very short story and think, okay, I can probably cut this. 
And I'm curious for you and your writing process, like how, how much do you end up drawing on your linguistic knowledge in your writing itself? Do you mean my knowledge of linguistics as a field or my knowing how to speak English like everybody else? Yeah, your knowledge in linguistics as a field. Like how do you move from this like implicit knowledge to in explicit knowledge as you're writing? Are you thinking like gerund participle etymology as you're writing or do you have to turn that do you turn that part of your brain off to be a writer? If it's like we if you say, does he drink, you mean alcohol. Does she write means does she write fiction? If you're a nonfiction writer and an editorialist, no one asks you questions like those. <laughs> um, I drink some coffee if it's the morning. If it's after six, I drink something else. Um, I'm definitely not thinking about linguistics. The way that I write sentences is two things. I've never thought about this until now. One, I say it in my head and then I write what I would say. Two, I look at it and I think that's a little too long, a little too baggy. And I think how to make it terser and a little bit more aphoristic. And the person I usually have in mind there is James Baldwin. Not because he was black, actually. I I like him. I've I'm not bragging, but I think I've read all of him. I enjoy him, but I'm not imitating him because he's my black hero, but because he had a very aphoristic way of writing. And I read all of him at a time when I started having to write a lot. Like if you have to crank it out for the Atlantic now, actually I'm at the New York times and it's every week. They are very demanding. You've got to crank it out. I read a lot of Baldwin in the mid teens when I started being in that kind of demand. And I thought, I need a little technique. And I thought, who writes in a way that I would like to? And it was him. So I'm wondering, how would James Baldwin have put it? And that means cutting a lot, because partly because he was him, and partly because he was doing it on a typewriter or longhand, his sentences were shorter. We tend to go longer now because of word processing. So I would say that he's very good at being concise in that elegant way. I'm sure many other people are. Not Hemingway, I find that mannered. But with Baldwin, it's a human being, and yet he managed to cut away everything. You don't want to overdo it, like um, what Gordon Lish did to Raymond Carver. I think that was that was butchery. That's that's too much. But Baldwin, that's yeah, yeah. So James Baldwin, that's the answer. You can see that I've never thought about it, but James Baldwin. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, you've also written about how language has an expressiveness cycle how words that might have an interesting literal or richly imagined meaning will like gradually lose that meaning. So, you know, the per first person who said, I ran away like a bat out of hell, right? That the person listening to them probably had a like rich reaction to that. And then it becomes tired. It becomes cliche. And I think as the writers, we're always searching for that thing that is like newly used in the language or maybe we can be the first person that uses that phrase even if we're not the first person maybe we're the first person to write it down and it's being you know said back and forth in you know spoken english and you've also written a lot about how like spoken english will sometimes be you know 200 years in advance and then eventually someone will will write a turn of phrase down so i'm curious yeah other thoughts you have about like searching for that that fresh way of saying something so that we're not stuck on this tail end of a phrase gradually losing its meaning and then like being recycled because yeah, we're all, all of your books are about this like very long gradual evolution of language and how um, things are entering and other things in the language are being lost and kind of staying on that cutting edge or near to that cutting edge whenever possible. If I take your meaning what I do to keep it fresh is go with the first thing I think rather than thinking that isn't writerly. I wouldn't want to read that to a class or something. I just go with what I think and then insist on it when the editor tries to cut it because it's too colorful or something like that. So for example, I forget them as soon as I write them, but two, two of them ago for, for the times I was writing about how I don't like that. Nowadays you have to stand up at the end of every play or show. So even if it was just, okay, you have to stand up. That annoys me. And I wrote about why it annoyed me in various ways. And I said, one problem is that if you insist on staying seated, then you're just sitting there. And I was thinking, 
the reason you get up is because you can't see the curtain call. And also, I thought I'm a little bit revulsed because all of a sudden there are all these butts right in your face. And I think a lot of people would have written because you can't see the curtain call and figured not the butts. But I said, no, I don't want to see. And I, and I didn't search for a way to put it. I just wrote what I was thinking. I don't want to see a wall of butts. And that is true. And then I was referring to that again at the end of the piece. And I thought, I can't say wall of butts again. What am I thinking about? What does it look like? And I thought, it looks to me like it's a, it's, it's a fence. It's a bunch of fence posts. And then I was thinking, what's the one word for that? And I thought, okay, colonnade. And then I, it can't be butts again. And so I reached for derrieres. So I said, <laughs> and another problem is that colonnade of derrieres. And I sent it in like that. So it was just the things that I thought of at the time. And they tried to get rid of the colonnade of derrieres. And I said, no, we're going to we're gonna keep that. And to be honest, from social media, I can tell people like that. It's being a baby is the way I do it. Just what I was feeling. That's And that's really true. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, and in terms of like rephrasing or paraphrasing yourself, you've written a lot about how um, languages develop and maintain complexities, redundancies, shades of social meaning. We have like, you know, 20 different ways that we can phrase like ask, ask is the Anglo-Saxon um, verb to ask. And then we have the French derived word to question. You have really read all the this. Yeah, I did truly have <laughs> the Latin derived word for interrogate, right? So you have like different layers of complexity for different levels of formality. And it sounds like you're kind of modulating yourself um, to some extent, but like maybe sticking to the base, um, some of the words that would actually be coming into our language through Anglo-Saxon rather than, rather than Latin. If that makes sense. There's something to that. Yeah. Churchill apparently liked to do it. Robert Moses had a sensitivity to it. You know, the, the belt parkway instead of the circumnavigatory or something like that. There's something to it that the Anglo-Saxon words have a kind of a beef stew. It's for dinner flavor. And then the French and the Latin words are a kind of outer layer. And so my favorite one of those actually is that there's help and there's aid and there's assist. Then there's also help out. And if you think about it, help out is different from help. They're not the same word. And help out and help are the Anglo ones. Aid is French and then assist is Latin. That's a neat little sandwich there. And you, I think, subconsciously choose which one of those to use. But we've got them. And in answer to a question that always comes, there's no language that doesn't have synonyms. And so many people think, well, this is the heritage of the English language. No. If you ask a Russian, how do you say help? They'll come up with about four or five different things. It's the it's the heritage of a language. Even unwritten languages have synonyms. Now, I, I shouldn't say this for recording, but if it hasn't been written down and you haven't got a whole lot of words collected that nobody uses, they don't have as many synonyms usually as English or Russian. You have to have a the weird thing called a dictionary. But if we're talking about languages that are written in particular, all of them have stacks of synonyms like that. And all languages have synony synonymy to some extent. Great. I have one more question and then I'm going to turn it over to the audience to ask some of their questions. Um, and I'm just curious, are there any writers whose work is particularly linguistically satisfying to you? Um, or do you turn that part of your brain off when you're reading? All right. That's different if it's fiction or nonfiction. And I don't read enough fiction. And the fiction that I read tends to be older which makes me kind of boring. So I can't talk about, can't even think of anybody, um, that person, you know, who's writing now. Um, Colson Whitehead, never read any of it. It's not because it doesn't look good, but because I was too busy reading James Baldwin or something like that. But um, Saul Bellow, the way he wrote both up and down to me was a dazzling performance, um, particularly um, Augie March and Herzog. That, that's incredible language. Anything that Baldwin wrote, not his lesser novels kind of slipped there, but especially his, his, his better novels and his essays are linguistically amazing. And also, this is, um, I don't say this as much as I used to because I've come to have some personal issues with him from a distance, not that I know him. But there is a writer, he writes on 
one of my favorite subjects, which is musical theater and old movies and all of that. He's probably the best writer about that, knows everything. Clearly, I don't know him, but he's clearly living on some kind of inheritance. And so he can write one book after another that nobody's going to read but me and some other people. And yet he doesn't have a job. So he's been doing this for about 50 years. The way he writes, I learned some of my Gabby way of writing from him. It's just him sitting with a martini talking about Hello, Dolly. And you know, he knows all these details and he doesn't bother to sound written at all. Um, I honest, I'm not going to say what I think about him, but I wouldn't even want to meet him. Unfortunately, I've learned as I've become more mature, there's some things you can read between the lines. But he does that. He he is also known more in the the, the gay community. He writes books about being gay. I haven't read them, but I'll bet they are great novels because th the way he writes the nonfiction is astonishing. But Ethan Morden is a scary good writer if you want to write the way you talk and yet not sound trivial. I forgot to mention I got a lot of that from him, even though I'm not writing you know, about Hello, Dolly much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Any questions from the audience? Uh, thanks so much for coming. This was a uh, pleasure. Really cool. Um, <laughs> so um, I wanted to ask you about um, something you mentioned, um, slurs, um, specifically the N-word. Um, when I was growing up in New York City, private school, um, you know, uh, Huck Finn, um, it's like as you like as you said it was totally acceptable to say it you know um, in context right yeah referring to it literally um but then um you know i went to college and then at some point you know i'm 27 now it, it it's today and it's not okay to say it all it's just the n-word right um and um i'm just wondering uh your thoughts on that evolution and yeah i guess what what happened what happened around 2010 2015 and, and... Yeah. um that development has been um in progress since the mid 90s and it really kicked in uh, in about 2012 2013 yeah. that you can't even refer to it i really don't like that i find um it's gone from being a slur and a slur is a terrible thing, to a magic word. And I feel, this gets into my grouchy, I don't like him anymore, woke racism territory, but I feel infantilized by that. As in, I can't listen to Huckleberry Finn being discussed because of, of that word, and it reminds me of my ancestors' slavery. No. And the reason I feel that way is not that I'm athletically making up a contrary point of view. Because I'm 58, and I was very much a grown-up a long time ago, I remember doing radio interviews with people of all colors where you could, you didn't want to overdo it, but you could say it. And the fact that you can't say it, I just find, you know, I find it very fake, to tell you the truth. And Huckleberry Finn, you know, I would, um, I don't think I'm going to read that particular book to my girls, but if I did, if I did, I would use it and I'd say, and the thing is, I wouldn't even have to say my youngest is nine. She already understands the contours of that word through listening to language. But if I wasn't going to read to them, I would certainly do it. And to be honest, and, you know, there are larger issues in the world these days, but I would wish white parents would, what's going to come down to is they're not going to read the book at all. Yeah. Or if you do read it, you're going to, God knows how somebody's going to get through it saying the N word or, you know, pretending that the word is Raymond or something like that. It wasn't that way until 10 minutes ago, and I really don't like it. And I didn't stress that too much in Nine Nasty Words because I wanted that to be a happy book. And I don't know how much my opinion matters because I don't think it can change anything. But what you saw getting into your 20s, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I wish it would go back to the way it was in the grand old days of 1998. But you can't, you can't reverse time. Um. Maybe, but it's hard to imagine how you get the toothpaste back yeah. in the tube. It might just be this way forever. And you know, again, 
there are larger issues than that. I yeah. mean, you know, there have got some problems in life, but that is not my favorite thing. Another question. I'm going to follow up to the same question, but I haven't fully questioned that yet. But that's called being alive. <laughs> First of all, I'm curious what the shift was in the mid 90s that kind of influenced this. It also makes me think how the N word, like that phrase, uh, created a convention, whereas now the R word also and the F slur also. So they're all getting replacements that have the exact same context. So, what, what are we doing? For? I don't know. Those are more family friendly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll be friendly. Yeah. Like what what happened? Yeah, yeah. Um two the first thing that happened, and it almost seems trivial, uh, but it's funny you say this this week with the e expiration of OJ Simpson, is that <laughs> is that Christopher Darden, the lawyer, did this grand speech. Like if there were an opera, it would be a great aria about what a powerful word the n-word was and it was on tv everybody saw it and it made a difference in how people felt about it because mark Furman, the cop had used the word that's when it started but what really pushed it over the edge was around 2012 2013 is the era when what we would now call woke became more mainstream and it was part of that sensibility and not just woke as in what we used to think of it as, as just you know, being aware of, of good, solid leftist politics, but the more prosecutorial woke. And that's when you started getting in trouble for ever saying it at all. I remember around 2013 thinking, I'm black and I can't say it. Not even as a joke, not in my classes. I can tell that it wouldn't be worth it to say it. That happened then. And so it starts with Christopher Darden and how much people talked about race at that time when everybody was around the TV set. There were still TVs then. And then 2012, when everybody, well, 2009 is when uh, Facebook and Twitter became default. Nobody was thinking that then, but that was the year that it went from, you know, you, you, are you on Facebook to your mother being on Facebook? Or why aren't you on Twitter? That happened in 2009. 2012, everybody has an iPhone. And then there were the um, the murders of Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin. That created a new mood. That's when everything changed. And so 2012 is when there was a real break in the dam. And you know, Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, those were terrible things. But it did create this new, rather religious attitude towards slurs. So that. It's a lot of history. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, have you noticed that people are turning everything into verbs? And do you <laughs> give me an example? Um, um, like I'm looking for an agent right now, and they're they're saying I've been agenting for 15 years, which just sounds ridiculous. Um, everything. People have been turning nouns into verbs. Not to be a smart ass, but that's been going on since literally the 1400s. And so, for example, it used to be that there was a copy, the idea that you would copy something. But if you mean adulting, agenting and all of that, that's this new thing that doesn't have an official name. That's this kid speak that started about seven years ago where you pretend to talk kind of like a child. Like now it almost sounds normal. It does sound normal. I did that because rain. That was weird yeah. seven years ago. And that's another one of those things where you're you're talking like a child. So that's that. <laughs> and so, yeah. And why people started doing that? Some people, I, wait, didn't, I wrote a, a piece about that. What did I, what did I say? Um, that, that it's a scary world and that young people are beginning to resist. Young people don't want to be adults in the way that they used to. And there was polling data on that. It used to be you wanted to grow up and put on a hat and start drinking. But nowadays, if you are a kid, you might not want to do this adulting. Eight or nine years ago is when that started. Yeah. Now, why then? The standard answer is iPhones, that something happens with phones that drives children crazy, et cetera. And that's that whole debate right now as to whether the iPhone rewires the mind. But it certainly does seem to come in with that era. Yeah, adulting. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, 
earlier you mentioned that historically language is getting more complicated generation to generation. Do you think English has become more complicated or less complicated? The problem is that writing tend, oh, by the way, I don't have COVID. I have a um, mild bronchial asthma condition that for some reason in this season always kicks in around six. And then around 8 p.m. suddenly it just stops, but it's six. And so that's what this is. I do not have a disease. Anyway, um, the, um, the complexity, the problem with it is that writing has a way of retarding language change and keeping things the way they are. And so English isn't allowed to develop, at least in its official register, the sorts of things that it would. But there are things that are happening that you just don't think about because we don't think about them as real language. And so, for example, if I say, um, and I'm not using the profanity to be cute, it's just a beautiful example. That was a pink ass piano, if I, if I say that. Now, you might say, well, if, imagine somebody comes from Poland and they're just learning English. Why did he say pink ass piano? The piano doesn't have you know, a butt. And you say, well, that means that the piano was really, really pink. But that's not what it means, because you would say that if the piano were pink, but even just kind of scuffed. Pink ass means that it's counterintuitively pink. And so if I said, there's, oh, look at that, that black ass squirrel. It's because most of our squirrels are gray. Whereas if you go some places, for some reason, they're all black. It means that you're surprised at the quality of that. That didn't exist in English until roughly 1910, and it really took off in the 90s. And if you didn't know that ass is supposedly profane, that's subtle. Not all languages have such an overt way of marking the counterintuitive. But we don't think of it as real language because it's slang, and we think of it as something that you wouldn't put in the New York Times. But things like that are happening all the time. You all, one might, especially as a linguist, listen to new things in the language and think, oh, wow. That means that now we have a this, but whatever the this is, is not accepted as real. And there you go. Like, for example, the way that people use like, which irritates so many people, is very rich, very subtle. And if you found it used in a rainforest language spoken by 600 people, like let's say that it's, it's, it's gook, gook, and they're always saying gook. The last thing you're going to say is, why do they say that? What that, that word isn't right. You would think as a linguist, what conditions the use of gook? What does gook subtly mean? And you'd find that it has about three different meanings. We hear like, and we think, well, people say it too much and it's no good. So yes, but it's very hard to perceive it because we tend to reject novelty, especially when there's writing. That's it. <laughs> 30 years ago, I started in the same use of and where you maybe say two instead. And I've noticed that actually I'm finding in of that that are much older. I thought it was a fairly recent thing. So I'm just wondering if you can shed any light on that, like how long have people been doing that or how did that start or why did it start? You mean try and do it? Yeah. Um, you were correct. It goes back further. I mean, so often what you think of as new turns out to have been done by people, you know, before penicillin or, you know, people walking around in armor. And with go and do it and try and do it, you can find both of those. Go and come in and try and. You can find, let me see, try and goes back to, I think, the 1600s. Go and and come and are practically in, in Beowulf. And it's because certain verbs that are used in that. No, wait, 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 wait. You know what? The honest answer that I have, I saw an article about this about six months ago, and I read it very quickly because I had other stuff to do. And to be honest, what I remember is the dates, but I forget what the explanation was. They had an explanation that they weren't very confident in. It was kind of a mystery as to why you say try and versus try to. If you really care, and I swear it'll take me a few weeks, get my email at Columbia, write me, and I will dig that article back up because I'd like to know now what the explanation was. But it's older than we think, and it doesn't seem to have any semantic meaning. It's just try to, try in. Yeah, and it feels wrong. I know what you mean, but really it's it's innocent. And I'll bet if you looked carefully, you would find that try to and try and actually mean something a little bit different. And so that's complexity right there. But you'd have to really 
grill the data to see what it is that we subconsciously mean? That is the honest answer to that. I'm glad you asked that because it reminds me I should have actually read that. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Yeah, we have time for one more. Otherwise, we could uh, wrap it up here. I um, how do I phrase this? Uh, <laughs> I'm interested to hear your opinion on um, like the evolution of language, how it uh, is uh, has evolved because of the internet. There are a lot of words, for example, cooked, gagged, like <laughs> like you but what's but, gagged? Oh, I'm I'm gagged. Yeah. This is like being uh shot. Oh okay. shot. it's like Paris is burning bar yeah. Two out of three things seem to come from that source. I'm I'm noticing. Yeah. So there are all these subcultures in America that have their own slut in it, and it's so it's it's now made public on the internet. And what do you think that's going to do to English language that just like the, the internet is causing all slang to be kind of folded in to the public discourse if that makes sense? I, I think yeah um it's too early to say but it's beginning to be clear that the internet creates a much richer churn than there used to be so there's always slang there were the people who read who listened to beowulf had slang that we'll never know but these days what would have been underground slang is there for everybody to see and because of the increasing informality of society you're going to see more people using it online and for example, because racism persists, but nevertheless, the line between black people and other people is much less stark than it used to be. And so the slang permeates. And so I'm noticing that with um, my students at Columbia, I like to get the slang out of them as it comes up and say, what, what did that word mean? What did that term mean? It seems almost always that somebody pops up in the back of the room and says that it starts with the ballroom culture words. And so that's really happened. There's been a rich slang in that since the late 20, 19 teens, but who knew it in 1953, except for people who were there. Things are changing in that way too, but yeah. And things seem to go around faster. I used to avoid saying that, but it's hard not to miss it at this point. Slang used to settle in and stay for a bit. Now it, it cycles very quickly because we're all just looking at so much of it going by. It's fascinating. And it documents all of this stuff. You know, what was the slang in 1930? We know a few things from movies, but for example, Bugs Bunny, what's up doc? That was the way kids, white rural kids in Texas were greeting each other for about 10 minutes. And so what's up doc? Well, the person who created the first Bugs Bunny cartoon happened to be from that environment and had Bugs Bunny say that. We would never know that now. Anybody who was saying what's up doc casually is now very dead, but we, we catch it. We catch it in Bugs Bunny. Now we know. You know, you could probably find out now how people say hello in rural Texas. Just go on Twitter. So yeah, it's a. I mean X. So it's a. It, it, we are we are in a new world in that way. It's exciting. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. Let's thank. Uh, John. Oh, thank you.